What is liberty? What does it mean? People will fight to be free, but once again, liberty is under assault. How can it best be defended? I'm Ian Martin. In this series, I'll talk to leading scholars and authors. Our theme, liberty. Katja Hoyer is a German-British historian and journalist with East German roots. She's a visiting research fellow at King's College London and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Liberty was denied to East Germans during the Cold War. What was their perception of the freedoms enjoyed by the West? And how did that shape what happened after the Cold War? Katja Hoyer, how did the freedoms of East Germans compare to the rest of the Soviet Union during the Cold War? I think there was quite a difference. East Germany is often perceived as, as just another Russian colony, as it were, or a Soviet colony during the Cold War. But I think they were left to almost have a kind of German type of socialism um, because of the way that the East German leaders were trusted by the Soviet regime. Um, Walter Ulbricht, for instance, who set up the, uh, the GDR effectively, um, spent his war years in Moscow and was therefore known to Stalin personally and, and to other uh, Soviet leaders. And therefore, East Germany was left to, to keep the German colors as its flag. Um, German, East German soldiers still had kind of German looking uniforms, um, quite uncannily actually looking like the, the Nazi uniforms in many ways. Um, and, and all of that was basically left whilst um, many of the nations of the, of the rest of the Soviet bloc felt that their very nationhood um, had kind of become under, or had come under Russian um, and Soviet Russian dominion. And in that respect, I think there's a difference there in the way that East German Germans perceived themselves to have a, have a degree of freedom, I think, that was lacking in, in the... That's not to say that it was necessarily real, but there was a perception there that, that people were freer, I Almost think. Almost an than, elevated status within, within the Soviet, Soviet yes, and to, sphere to, of influence. To the point, actually, where the, the Soviets became annoyed with that self-perception of, of East Germans. Um, so there are many anecdotes where Walter Obrecht in particular would, would take it upon himself to lecture Soviet leaders about how far the GDR had come in its, in its socialism and its, in its economy. Um, and would kind of become the, the, the teacher, basically, of the rest of the Soviet bloc, which, of course, massively annoyed the Soviets as well. So there is a sense of exceptionalism within the, within the East German elites, I would say. So it's a, it's a police state, um, you know, a society in which freedom is um, effectively eliminated. How, in that context, did East Germans view the freedoms of the West? What was the perspective? Well, they had little windows into the West, I would say, rather than an actual real perception of, of what the West was like. So because there wasn't the freedom to travel, they couldn't, most East Germans didn't experience the West for themselves. But they could watch Western television, which eventually became kind of tacitly ignored, at least by the, by the regime. Everyone knew that they were watching West German television to the point, actually, where East German TV um, presenters and organizers had to adapt their own program to make sure when there was a kind of crowd pleaser on in the West, they didn't want their own program to clash with that. So it became that kind of widespread. Um, but if, if you imagine you'd never been to, say, Britain, and you view Britain via the lens of the BBC, you get a very, very narrow kind of idea of, of what the West is like. Um, there were also um, so-called intershops. Um, so they were... Um, sort of Western uh, shops that you could buy uh, Western products in if you had hard currency. Um, and again, you know, because of the way that this was very limited in terms of the, the range of products that it showed you, you know, you walked in there and immediately there was the smell of Western washing powders, coffee. Um, you know, people said it, it smelled of the West um, and it smelled of freedom and, and it became almost like a mystical thing. Um, and there are so many sort of little windows into the West that existed without there actually being a conception of what it meant to live in a, in a Western society kind of manifesting itself. Were those shops that you described, were they really a mistake? I think in many ways they were. I mean, originally they were set up by the regime so that when Western travellers or journalists or tradespeople came into the country, they could buy products that they were used to. So the idea was they would bring their own hard currency into the GDR and buy, say, coffee with their own currency and therefore obviously bring hard currency into the country. Um, 
but that also meant because there wasn't actually a kind of ban on East Germans to go in. So if you could get hold of Western currency yourself, say through relatives in the West, um, then you could also go in there and buy things from it. And, and gradually that became open, legally open to East Germans. And there was always a, a kind of advice towards um, uniformed people, so say party officials or people that were in the army, not to go in there with their actual badge on it or their uniform on, because there was still this kind of idea that it's like a sort of naughty thing to do almost. Um, but people accepted that. Um, but because of that, it became quite a widespread thing to do. So people would develop a penchant for particular products. So say for instance, my own, so I'm from East Germany, my own grandmother um, loved tinned pineapple of all things. Um, and it was just something that was completely rare in the GDR. Um, so she would on occasion just sort of save up some money and then go in and, and buy, you know, for a ridiculous amount of money, buy sort of a little tin of pineapple chunks basically. And it's, it's things like that, I think, that introduced an element of consumerism into what was supposed to be a socialist kind of collective society that didn't care about those things that got people thinking about, you know, material kind of desires that they might have. And, and as I say, the very smell of the, of the shop became a kind of almost magical, mystical thing to people. So it's, I think it was a mistake to kind of introduce them and to open them up to, to a wide society. And thereby tacitly approve of kind of a form of consumerism. Does pop music and uh, film, do they, do they play a role? Yeah, hugely. I mean, it's a similar thing in that the regime went through sort of phases of banning those things and then opening up again. And during the opening up phases, you basically had a situation where uh, Western music, for instance, um, there was a 40-60% ratio on the radio and then discos and things. So you had to play 60% music from the GDR and, and the Eastern Bloc um, and 40% um, was allowed to be Western music. So obviously you can imagine you've got some like village disco somewhere, you know, nobody cares how much Western music you play really. And when the, when the official came along sort of at, you know, 11 o'clock in the evening and asked you whether you'd been playing the correct ratio of music, people just, you know, gave him a bottle of beer and said, come on, sit down and, you know, um, don't take it so seriously. And quite often they didn't because it's very hard to police whether exactly 40% and 60% of the music ratios were, were kept. So therefore you had things like a Beatlemania in, in East Germany. There were Elvis fan clubs um, and, and there was, you know, sort of, pop culture basically developing amongst uh, young people and, and you get all of the same kinds of like musical trends and, and things like that basically in, in East Germany as well, bringing the culture and the kind of ideas behind those things with them. So what was the attraction? Was it liberty? Was it the excitement, the possibility? Did it seem sort of bigger, noisier, Western pop culture, I mean? I mean, part of it is the same attraction that you have in the West. Um, so where it's like a generational thing. Um, basically, if you take something like, say, the Rolling Stones, you know, there was an element of kind of youth rebellion in that, just sort of showing your parents that you're into this sort of rebellious stuff. Um, so there is that, um, which I say, I would say doesn't differ all that much from the West in that respect. But the added element is this kind of thing that it's like the forbidden thing, even though it wasn't actually outright forbidden, but anything that came from the West because it was so hard to come by. So say when there was a shipment of, of Beatles LPs, you know, people would literally queue out the shops and, and try and get one of those because they didn't come in all that often. So um, that made it rarer, made it more desirable and, and made it kind of a, a more, um, yeah, almost, almost sort of mystical <clears throat> thing to get hold of as opposed to the Eastern bands trying to, mm. to replicate the same sort of spirit. And how accurate do you think the, the East German understanding or conception of uh, Western freedom really was? Was it a, a spot on or exaggerated? I think exaggerated and because it was through those very narrow windows of purely sort of consumerism. Imagine trying to, to see the world of, of Western freedom through the lens of consumerism only. So you basically don't know really what it's like to have complete freedom over what kind of job you choose, for example, whether you go to university or not, um, you know, freedom of opinion and expression, those kinds of things. They don't really come with the adverts and with the shops and with the films and the music that you watch. Um, so in that respect, I would say it, it was a little bit slanted. And when in the 90s, those kind of economic freedoms came with economic risks um, and with a, a degree of responsibility for your own um, well-being, economic well-being certainly, 
it came as a bit of a shock, I think, to many East Germans that, that those kind of realities also came with, with the freedom that they were promised. And what role was there for propaganda? Um, did the East German government effectively try and counter the popularity of Western pop culture or say, look, there's a darker side to it? Was there, there, there an effort to essentially paint the West as being all about unemployment and the excessive competition and all of the things that the communists thought was wrong with the Western system? Well, it sort of, again, it fluctuated completely depending on whether they were in one of their phases where they wanted to loosen up things a little bit or whether they were cracking down on, on things that really did fluctuate in sort of five-year, I would say, phases roughly. Um, so as one famous um, sp sort of speech or comment by Walter Ulbricht, the, the first leader of the GDR, who said, do we need to copy everything from the West, including the yeah, yeah, yeah? And he said this in this really kind of broad Saxon dialect, which is a, a bit of a kind of comical accent in Germany that many people make fun of. So that kind of heightened the whole idea that he was just kind of old and, and a bit stuffy and, and was against those sort of Western things coming in. But they did understand, and, and this is the same man, Ulbricht as well, shortly afterwards, that that's what young people wanted. And because they were losing so many in the youth movements that had initially signed up, with genuine enthusiasm because they wanted to build this idealistic society to start with. And then kind of it all got a bit um, boring and, and different from what they wanted and, and people were turning away. He actually sat down with young people and said, well, what, what is it that you find boring about us? What do we need to change? And then pumped a lot of money into producing East German music that was actually genuinely kind of worth listening to, basically. Um, and that, in a way, suited a lot of the bands as well. So there were a lot of East German bands who, to start with, were playing um, like cover versions of, West Ger of, of Western songs, either West German or, or kind of British and, and American music. And because they were now forced to make their own music, suddenly you get this kind of creative output that wasn't there before. So in some ways, it suited the cultural scene in the in the GDR that there was an attempt to sort of create German music that wasn't just a replica of what was already or East German music that wasn't just a replica of what was already there and then this kind of Ost rock it's called so Eastern rock basically scene developed from that which genuinely put out some some stuff that was worth listening to and still is. But it's a, a police state throughout but you described this these sort of waves of, of these fluctuations as the as the re regime tries to loosen up a bit and then reasserts its, its, its authority. What's driving that shift? Is it a response to what's happening in Moscow or geopolitical trends, or is it all about trying to validate the regime and, exp and, and, and try and convince the younger generation? Well, part of it, I think, is is a, just a desire to survive, basically, and allow the system to survive. They, they were very, very conscious of the uh, kind of relative youth of the East German state, the, the fact that it was kind of created out of the Second World War wasn't therefore a, a state that had sort of naturally grown or, or was naturally chosen by the people as such. So they did need to make sure that they survived as a regime and were therefore always on the lookout. Um, and the intershops are another example of that, of looking out for what the population wants and trying to give the population as much of that as they can without actually losing the the nature of what they were trying to do, basically, so without turning themselves into another capitalist society. I mean, not least because the Soviets wouldn't have allowed it. They were very, very critical of some of those openings um, as well. And not always in tandem. It's interesting sometimes that, say, for instance, Anna Khrushchev, the, the Soviet Union opens up a little bit, and the East German re regime suddenly panics and thinks, well, what are we going to do about this? And they almost push back against it, and then it's vice versa again. You end up with the, with the Soviets cracking down and with the East German regimes saying, no, we're not doing that because um, it doesn't suit our uh, situation right now. So it is driven largely by a desire to try and keep the people on side as much as possible um, and sort of giving them what they want as much as is possible without changing the system. But is there a problem that even something like pop music or rock music like the Stones or the Beatles is really, a, it, 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 it may be pop culture, but it's a product, isn't it, of freedom mm. of expression. In allowing that, are they allowing people access to other ideas as well? In that if you can write or sing a song about anything that you choose and choose conflict with authority, then 
buried in the lyrics and the message is something really rather transgressive in East German terms and politically very powerful. Yeah, and you just the, the argument you just described played out behind the scenes is really interesting when you look at um, sort of you know, the discussions within the Politburo about this. Um, so, for example, the scene I described earlier where Walter Ulbricht was basically getting youth representatives in to tell him what needed to change. And those were people that were actually on, you know, the radar of the Stasi basically as potentially dangerous. They were student leaders and people like that. And Margot Honecker, the wife of the future leader, um, um, Erich Honecker, felt, because she was responsible for education and youth development, felt very, very threatened by that and actually censored a lot of that behind the scenes and said, even though she wasn't leading the, the GDR, um, she said, well, look, there, there's, a, there's a point at which uh, music and dance culture and all of those things transgress into politics. So where does the dancing and the music stop? Where do the politics begin? Um, it's exactly that sort of conflict you just described. And she realized that. And it's interesting when you see her sort of scribblings on the side of the of those kind of policy notes, it's always no, you know, with like large letters with an exclamation mark, we're not doing this. Um, because she was frightened specifically of, of those influences. So presumably that's a split between those who think, well, it's just music, it's just pop, Western bubblegum, consumerist mm. nonsense. And then those who see that actually at the heart of it is something, something potentially transformative. I mean, Keith Richards said famously, um, and much as I love Keith Richards, po possibly a bit of an exaggeration, said that it was the uh, it was the Stones or it was rock and ro it was rock and roll that that brought down the Berlin Wall. And while it is an exaggeration, you can see in the context that you're describing what he means. Yeah, I mean, famously, David Hasselhoff claimed that he brought down the Berlin Wall with his uh, "I've been looking for freedom" singing on the on the Berlin Wall. I suspect that the Stones, with their <laughs> extraordinary career, play a play, play a greater role. But maybe that's yeah. just my personal bias. Well, there, there is an element of that. Um, I would say, on the whole, um, most most East Germans that listen to Western music because they didn't understand the lyrics, I mean, you know, that's worth bearing in mind, is, is that you'd have to go out of your way to find out what the lyrics actually mean. Um, just enjoyed the, the beat of it and the, and the sort of poppiness of it. But with that, even if you don't understand the lyrics, there comes a certain, you know, lifestyle, a certain uh, sort of leisurely way of doing things that, you know, crept into youth culture, you know, be that hairstyles or, or just the way that you dress and... From that, you know, with that, you, you're going to trigger a response from the from the regime in terms of watching you, keeping an eye on you, potentially barring your your career opportunities and so on and so forth, which then made people rail against that in turn. So it's kind of like a spiral that you yeah. kickstart with that in some respects. It's the it's the sound of liberation, isn't it? But what was the West German view of East Germany in this period? Um, I think Germany is in the unique position that it had like this kind of competition between the systems play out almost as a kind of odd political experiment with the same people. So you have the country split um, basically into a socialist and a capitalist society. Um, and therefore they, they always looked at each other to see how well or not well the other one is doing and then try to exploit uh, weaknesses basically in the, in the media. And with East Germany, that, that was the obvious example to look to for West Germany to say to its own people, well, look, they're doing this and this, this is why it's not working. So there are examples, for instance, where, say, somebody commits suicide and then the, the West was specifically looking for anything political in their lives to, to spin it so that they had basically committed suicide because they were oppressed by the regime. Those cases were there as well, but basically that in, in itself then triggered a response in the East against that because they sort of felt everything that they did was being watched and, and exploited by, by the West. So to the West, the East served as an example of this is why we're not doing these things. And quite often when it's policy where the political left in West Germany, so say the SPD, the Social Democrats, were pointing towards things in the East, like say free childcare or the, the high rate of female employment, and saying, shouldn't we have a look at that and learn from it? The, the conservatives in West Germany pushed back and said, oh, but they only have these things to prop all of the other things up that, that are part of the ideological sort of package, if you will. And that then allowed those policies to be justified in the long run. So in many ways, East Germany so, served as a kind of counterfoil to what people were trying to do in the West. So what you've just described there, I mean, that sounds like the origins of what became Schroeder and Schroeder and then Merkel, mm. Merkelism, mm. 
I know from different parties, but with a common thread running through them, which is essentially a sort of different attitude about the East mm. and then about Russia. Yeah, I mean, it started really with, with Willy Brandt, um, uh, sort of that, that whole period where in the West you also get very kind of uh, strong left-wing tendencies, sort of late 60s, basically, 68, 69, um, when Willy Brandt famously, kind of with his Ostpolitik, looked towards the Soviet Union, but also towards East Germany, and tried to kind of create links there, almost working towards a coexistence of the two states. And interestingly, you get the same movement in the in the East because Erich Koniger becomes um, the, the leader of the GDR in, in 1971. Um, and there is sort of some sort of hope on both sides that they can work towards kind of a peaceful coexistence of the two German states, but always with the view to eventually making the other state kind of a, a, an image of, of your own and eventually merging the two together, but under the system that they imagined, you know, would be the better one. So effectively, Honecker thought, if we work with the left in Germany, we can make this a, a kind of leftist state and eventually merge the two together. Willy Brandt thought, same thing, we make that a social, social democratic state and eventually perhaps they can, they can grow back together in this way. So they, they just were closer together politically and there was less of a fear from, from the Western side that importing any aspect of the GDR makes kind of a, a socialist argument in the West. What's the impact of, well, let's be blunt, the West's victory, the West in the broader sense, West Germany and the West as a community of, of democracies, effectively wins the Cold War. And the impact on the East is initially, presumably, jubilation mm. uh, and and freedoms which have been denied uh, are, are, are gained. So it's a process of liberation. But do people relatively quickly become disenchanted? I think so. I mean, there, there's a, with the jubilation as well, a lot of people, I mean, you wouldn't have seen those on the street because they were sitting at home worrying about things. But a lot of people's jobs directly depended on being part of a socialist system, if you'd learned a very specific type of job that just didn't exist anymore afterwards, because say things were automated, or um, say if it's within the hierarchy of, of the army and, and those you know ranks were different and so on and so forth, your, your very a kind of economic existence depended on that system. And also people were, they had done their jobs for, for a very long time and your job effectively identified you as a, as a person, what kind of person you were. So losing that meant losing your entire identity and many people were worried about that even as the Berlin Wall began to, to be opened up. So even before the two states were, were unified a year later. Um, and then once unification set in, as you say, the vast majority of people wanted their country to be reunified. Um, but hadn't really quite appreciated what that meant for their own lives necessarily. And once uh, mass unemployment, for instance, set in, uh, people lost their livelihoods, um, entire regions in the East became depleted because people lost those jobs, the, the industry was, was dismantled, coal mines were closed, that sort of stuff. Um, you see entire regions just decaying very quickly in the 90s and, and people associated that with the sort of failed unification process, which in turn meant that the entire system of sort of Western um, values and, and Western uh, freedom in, in, in the freedom of choice, basically, in the sense that you don't live in a safe, secure, compartmentalized life anymore, uh, began to be questioned by people. And that's when I think the, the sort of quite toxic disillusionment set in that you still see in, in many parts of the East today. And you see quite a, a bit in that period immediately afterwards around the privatization programs and political murder and uh, you know, effectively you know, political deep, discon deep discontent. How, did, how does, does that settle down? Does that just sort of fade out over the following 20 years? Does Germany and the relationship between the East and West settle down into something more like, something more cohesive, something more normal? I think it did for the middle classes largely because they were sort of looking towards the West in any case, having now better salaries, being able to buy things in the shops, having career progressment or kind of progression that they didn't have before. Free movement. Yeah, free travel. movement of travel. Lots of people actually moved uh, into the West as well. Um, all of that meant that the middle classes found it very, very easy to get on with their sort of counterparts in the West suddenly being kind of on eye level with them. But for the workers who were sort of very highly 
rated by the GDR. So if you were, say, a mechanic or, um, I don't know, you worked in a factory in a, in a really specialized job or you worked in the chemical industry, um, they were actually the highest paid people in the GDR because you worked towards your targets. If you met them, if you exceeded them, you earned a really good, you know, decent salary whilst, say, somebody who is, I don't know, a teacher or a lawyer or a politician, that they're stuck basically to their specific pay rates. So suddenly your role is depreciated a lot and Western people look down on you and say, well, you worked in a system that, that didn't produce enough worth and therefore you're in, what you did for the last 20 or 30 years was practically in vain. And that really hit home, I think, on a level that went beyond the economic. I think it was just a sort of depreciation of people's self-worth in a way that, that stuck and that stung. Um, and I don't think that's gone away. I think, in, if anything, it's sort of settled into like a kind of simmering resentment, really, that you still see in higher votes for the AfD, for example, for the right wing party in, in, in East Germany. Um, more people were willing to buy into like conspiracy theories during the, during the pandemic um, and those kinds of things where there's almost like an escape into reasons or excuses to sort of hate the system that is now the, the political system that people live in. But there's the irony, isn't there, that the success of the German economic model post that period after the sort of painful reconstruction and reunification is rooted in looking east again in terms mm. of energy and accelerating reliance on, on Russian energy to drive some brilliant, brilliant exports to China and other markets. That process has now come unstuck, I think mm. it's fair to say, with the invasion of Ukraine. German politics is turned upside down. Where on earth is it headed, do you think? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I mean, that East-West dimension has suddenly become relevant in that respect again, because when you think, so say, for instance, the, the biggest, longest oil pipeline in the world is the, is the Tushba oil pipeline. There's a gas pipeline of the same name as well, but the, the oil one ends in Schwedt, which is on the, in the very far east of Germany, and creates thousands of jobs in the region. It also supplies the entire region of Berlin and Brandenburg with, with oil. Um, so now that there's an oil embargo um, in, the, in the making, people in the entire region are wondering, are we again going to bear the brunt you know, for, for this kind of West German political model that's been developed um, in terms of the economic fallout of that? So if you, even if you make up for the loss of oil, say, with, you know, by, by buying it from elsewhere, shipping it in, um, it still means that the region is going to lose its kind of economic foundations, the only thing that's there, frankly, in that region, because it is so devoid of people now, um, that people will again lose, potentially lose their jobs, lose their livelihoods, and they feel that they're again being ignored by the, by the people that make the politics. And there's only two East German ministers in the entire cabinet. So there's nobody there to say to people, well, look, you know, this is how people see it. And I think that's part of the reason why you see such high support for uh, Russia in the East compared to the West in Germany, which is quite disconcerting, but I think that's the economic dimension as part of that. So I think the Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, will have to find a way of getting all, all of kind of everyone in Germany behind him, not kind of just try and ignore that fifth of the population that seems to have gone off the rails a little bit, which is often how they portray it. Um, and needs, he needs to find a way, if he can, as a, as a sort of fairly left-wing politician who himself talked about the sort of imperialist, aggressive NATO when he was a young socialist in the West, if he can overcome his own reluctance towards the sort of Western systems of stability and uh, security, then surely he, he can find a way, hopefully, to, to get East Germans on board with that as well. But I think he, he will have to, simply because of the economic situation in Germany. Fascinating. So the questions of East and West resonate again. Katja Hoyer, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.